Next up this evening is Jonathan McIntosh. Jonathan McIntosh holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Dallas and has served as a fellow of humanities at New St. Andrews College here in Moscow since 2007 and where he teaches courses in political, moral, economic, and theological philosophy. The title of his talk this evening is Why We Must Get Serious About Natural Rights. Huh? You're all going to wait to see if this is any good before you <laughs> on. Yeah. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, for conservative Christians, the legacy of the concept of natural rights is far from an unambiguous one, cherished by some as a bulwark against tyranny, while deplored by others as a threat to stable social order. The verdict on whether the foundational role the concept of natural rights tradition has played in our own American political tradition, um, whether it's been good or bad, this verdict is anything but settled. To put a version of the problem as pointedly as we might, is the doctrine of natural rights responsible for having helped stave off our government's increasing takeover and corruption of our society for as long as it has? Or did the doctrine of natural rights in fact help contribute to creating, for example, the social and moral vacuum in our society, which nature abhorring a vacuum, our government merely stepped in to incompetently fill? Well, my own tentative suspicion, uh, you might actually might be surprised to hear, is that I think the answer is probably some element of both. And I'd like to suggest here that whatever the misuses, misuses and abuses of the doctrine of natural rights may have been in our own American history down to the present, the doctrine itself is both a necessary and salutary one. And that the sooner Bible-believing and God-fearing Christians come to terms with and maybe even come to love the doctrine, the better. Now, my objective in this paper is uh, fairly modest. In fact, it's so uh, unambitious, I'm not even going to be arguing a thesis uh, tonight, um, as much as it pains me to not uh, be doing that. Instead, I chose to just give an introductory uh, talk on, on the topic of natural rights, which after Tim's um, MMT talk, you might, you might be ready for uh, something a little lighter. Um, but it's, we're, we're, still doing, we're still doing philosophy. So the outline of my paper is as follows. First, I will give a definition generally what is meant by natural rights. Second, I will list what some of the more common criticisms of the doctrine of natural rights are or have been. Third, I'll give some evidence that um, if not um, the doctrine of natural rights per se, then at least the basic elements of such a doctrine, they've been around a, for a lot longer than many may appreciate. I wanna show this by looking at just a couple of passages from one of my favorite philosophers, St. Thomas Aquinas, 13th century philosopher, 1225 to 1274, um, are his dates. And fourth and finally, I'll conclude with some semi-random thoughts on how we might think about the doctrine of natural rights. So first, what is meant by natural rights? I should begin by saying that, uh, again, I'm not going to be giving anything like a technical definition here that would satisfy the analytic philosopher, um, but I'll be giving what I take to be a, a kind of commonsensical account that, that I think should be satisfactory to normal people. That's, that's you. Uh, to have a right to something, uh, whether it be a right uh, in relation to a person or to a thing or an action, uh, but to have a right to something is to have some kind of claim, an entitlement, a prerogative or privilege, um, a, a claim to something, with respect to something. A right is a permitted access to the thing, the person or action in question. As a claim, entitlement, prerogative or privilege, uh, or unimpeded access to something, a right involves not only a relation to the thing, the thing, the action or person to which one has a right, but it also involves a relation to everyone else who might otherwise pose an obstacle to one's access to that thing. And, and that obstacle could be intentional or it could be accidental. Rights then, and here I'm admittedly dipping now a little into more analytic treatments of the topic, rights involve what, are call, uh, what is called a three-term relation. Those three terms are the person possessing the right, 
the thing, person, or action that the right is about, and then those to whom the right is exercised or possessed in relation to, i.e. the person's needing to respect the right. So that's what a right generically is. So what makes a right a natural right? The concept of natural rights is the idea that there are rights, claims, entitlements, prerogatives, privileges that exist not only within society, or what are commonly called positive, civil, or legal rights. The concept of natural rights is the idea that there are rights um, more fundamentally than these legal rights. There are rights that exist pre-politically or even trans-politically. They are rights that are thought to exist not by human agreement, convention, or status within a particular political community, but they exist by nature, which is to say by human nature. Natural rights is the idea that simply by being human, one is automatically a member of a universal human communi community and therefore automatically entitled to all the rights, claims, entitlements, prerogatives, privileges that are proper to being a human, regardless of whether, whatever social ties one might also enjoy. Natural rights, accordingly, are held to be entirely independent of civil society and human positive law. They're universal belonging to every human being, and they are not only pre-political, but as I said earlier, trans-political in the sense that they have the more ultimate and universal basis, and so are more abiding and authoritative than any human society, government, or law can be. Indeed, a common political application of natural rights is that human societies, governments, or laws are held to be legitimate to the extent to which they protect and do not transgress our natural rights. That was the argument of uh, John Locke, for example. And insofar as natural rights are a function and consequence of our human nature, which cannot be alienated from us, right? A person can't choose to no longer be human, nor can he have his humanity taken away or denied by anyone else. So our natural rights are said to be inalienable. We cannot give them up without ceasing to be human, nor can these rights be taken away by others. Well, this metaphysical dimension of natural rights, that they're rights rooted in our nature as human beings, uh, implicates another feature, which is that natural rights are also moral rights. Natural rights are things that we have as moral beings whose actions are subject to moral evaluation. Our actions are either good or bad, lawful or unlawful, conducive to human flourishing or frustrative of our human nature. There are actions we must perform there are actions we must not perform, and there are actions that we are permitted to perform, and whose morality is dependent on any manner of circumstances, including in many cases our own subjective preferences. The concept of natural rights is one that was developed in part as a way of helping us define the moral boundaries between the contours among those areas of both duty and liberty on our part and on the part of those around us. By attempting to clearly delineate those areas in which one person has a claim, entitlement, prerogative, or privilege to act, natural rights serve as a signpost to everyone else, not just in our local communities, but in the universal human community, just where it would be morally wrong for others to impede, again, either intentionally or accidentally, to impede the action of one's neighbor. And as to what these natural rights consist in, finally, the principal ones, the ones that usually you see mentioned, are things like the right to life, the right to one's own person, the right to property, the right to pursue happiness, the right to self-defense, things of that nature. Well, if that's broadly what natural rights are, what could anyone possibly have against them? Well, quite a lot, as it turns out. Uh, let's turn to some of the common objections to natural rights. One common objection is the unbelieving secular Darwinist view that human beings, being the products of blind evolutionary processes, do not have a fixed moral nature. And so there cannot be any such thing as natural rights that are understood to be proper to such a nature. All rights and values then, um, if there are any, are historically and socially determined and, they, and are relative. More relevant to us, uh, 
here is the theological objection one sometimes hears from Christians who fear that the supposed naturalness of natural rights is some kind of secularizing attempt at grounding morality and moral values in an uh, in something other than God, grounding it in some kind of imminent natural order that we can understand and sort of exists, uh, is either exists or is able to be understood independently of any relationship to divine authority or the Bible. And given that we have the Bible, then what need do we have for natural rights anyway? A common epistemological objection to natural rights is that even if we grant that human beings have a nature, and even if it be acknowledged that that nature is created by God, which say many, at least up through the 19th century in the natural rights tradition, all would have said that we have the nature that we have from God, even if you're a, a, a deist, uh, for example, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, deists, they would have said uh, our nature from which our natural rights come is something given by God. Um, but even if we it be acknowledged that the nature we have is created by God, something that the natural rights as a tradition, as I say, from Locke all the way up to mid uh, 19th century would have would have admitted, there's still the problem of whether um, and how we can know we have natural rights or what the how we can know what these rights are. And to be sure, stating and defending philosophically what human nature is and what, if any, moral laws, rights, or entitlements that would follow from this nature, this is an admittedly difficult task. As the father of modern natural rights theory, John Locke himself appreciated, virtually every civil society that has ever existed has differed widely from each other in their moral values. In short, the doctrine of natural rights has struck some as overly doctrinaire, dogmatically claiming to know far more than we are able to know. The great father of modern conservatism, Edmund Burke, although he did not absolutely or unequivocally deny the existence of natural rights, he was famously ambivalent towards them and deeply skeptical about their practical knowability or applicability. If there are such things as natural rights, for all intents and purposes, they are unknowable by us. Burke carried his critique of natural rights further than this. Not only are they practically unknowable, but what we think our natural rights are really nothing of the sort. Instead, they're more often than not gross, naive, and even dangerous abstractions from what is the true and authentic source of rights, namely the much more concrete and contingent realities of history, custom, and tradition, and the particular communities to which one belongs. Rights are not inherent in human beings for Burke so much as they are inherited by them. Natural rights are not only naive in their self-forgetfulness of the true origins of rights, as Burke would view it, but they're actually dangerous in their naivete when they become unmoored from, pitted against, and made to stand in judgment of true historic rights, rights that are drawn from, from custom, tradition. As Burke saw them, especially in how they were being recklessly invoked in the French Revolution, natural rights function as an abstruse and abstract battering ram for knocking down the kind of historic institutions and received customs that make social order possible, and which provide the real foundation for liberty and rights. Closely related critique touched on by Burke, but also by his skeptical, skeptical contemporary and acquaintance, David Hume, is the charge that natural rights, far from giving us a way of accounting for the origins and legitimacy of proper government, right? Legitimate government, again, as the Lockean tradition argues, um, is, um, is legitimate to the extent that it protects natural rights. Um, but, but for Burke and Hume, far from giving a way of accounting for the origins and legitimacy of proper government, natural rights has actually served to undermine, the idea of natural rights serves to undermine legitimate governments. By postulating an imaginary and unrealistic list of rights that existed in a fictional, you know, putative, putative state of nature, the doctrine of natural rights has served as an instrument of seditious discontent inspiring disruptive civil disobedience at best and even catastrophic political revolution at worst, resulting in a real loss of life, social order, and their attendant liberties. The history of natural rights has been the history, <clears throat> excuse me, the history of natural rights has been the history of the purblind perfect playing the enemy of the good. A final criticism of natural rights is their seemingly radical individualism. Common claim, again, heard among 
uh, Christians, for example, is that we don't really have rights. We have duties. Whereas duties emphasize our social nature together with our obligations to and responsibilities for others within one's community, there would seem to be an unhealthy fixation on the individual in the doctrine of natural rights with their relentless insistence on what is owed to the individual. Corroborating this concern is the ever-expanding list of rights claims we have seen in, for example, the last half century or more. Labor rights, reproductive rights, gay rights, marriage equality, transgender rights. We even have animal rights now and more. As Marianne Glendon, uh, I think, uh, plausibly shows in her excellent book, Rights Talk, there's a connection between the explosion of new and invented rights in our own day and the obsession with natural rights that really goes back to uh you know, the founding of American, uh, uh, the American founding, for example, and even earlier. Well, having defined natural rights and considered some of the principal objections to the doctrine, I want to look briefly at a very important thinker in the Christian intellectual tradition as an illustration of something of the, um, I think, really the inevitability of the concept of natural rights. Uh, one figure commonly cited in connection with the history of the doctrine of natural rights is St. Thomas Aquinas. This is not because Aquinas himself had a doctrine of natural rights. He did not. Yet he did have a robust doctrine of natural law that has been viewed by many as having helped lay the foundation for the later development of a theory of natural rights. And there are many dimensions to Aquinas's anthropological, his uh, moral, and his political thought we might look at. But I want to highlight just a couple of passages that I've not seen um, other natural rights historians mentioned, which I think are quite suggestive, uh, quite suggestive where the development uh, or the later formulation of a natural rights theory is concerned. Uh, the first passage is actually, it's a cluster of different passages. Aquinas, Aquinas speaks in, in several different places across his writings, but where he discusses Aristotle's notion of true political rule or political authority. According to Aristotle, authentic political rule is any form of rule, and for him it didn't matter so much whether it was rule by one, monarchy, rule by a few, aristocracy, or rule by many, um, what's often called polity, um, not to be confused with democracy. That's when we have rule by many, not for the common good. Um, Aquinas defined democracy as uh, the poor oppressing the rich. Um, um, but according to Aristotle, authentic political rule is any form of rule, and again, it doesn't so much matter here whether it's rule by one, several, or many, but any uh, uh, form of rule in which rule is exercised for the benefit, not of the ruler, but of the ruled, where you're ruling for the benefit of the ruled. That's proper political rule. In an interesting twist, or I think it's a twist, Aquinas adds to Aristotle's account of true political rule. He, he adds to it by characterizing it as a form of rule in which the subject of that rule the subjects of that rule retain the right. The Latin is us, I-U-S. Uh, he says, uh, subjects of the rule of proper political rule retain the right to act in a manner contrary to the directives of the ruler. According to Aquinas, true political rule thus involves a significant area in which rulers have, apparently, the prerogative to direct their subjects' actions. Right? Hey, we think it'd be a good idea for you to do this. And yet the subject somehow also retain the free prerogative to say, great idea, not today, not going to do it. Interesting question. What would a government of that proper political rule uh, look like? Uh, but that's what he says. They, uh, subjects retain the right to act in a contrary manner. Um, in this way, I think Aquinas may be seen dimly pointing in the direction of a theory of natural rights in which individuals are understood to possess the right of free action that is not and cannot be coercively constrained by law or government. The second passage in which I've seen Aquinas, I think, playing the harbinger of later natural rights doctrine is in his discussion of how the judicial precepts of the Mosaic law properly ordered the citizens of the Hebrew commonwealth with respect to each other. Uh, Aquinas distinguishes between two different ways in which the relationships among men are generally brought about. Two different ways, broadly. This isn't the only way you could classify them, but he says two ways in which you could think about the relations amongst men being as being brought about or established. 
The first way in which relations among men may be established or effectuated is through some exercise of political authority. Some political authority is ordering, directing, decreeing that some men be related in some fashion. The second way in which relations among men are established, according to Aquinas, are by what he calls, quote, the will of private individuals. He goes on to say that, quote, whatever is subject to the power of an individual, right, whatever is subject to the power of an individual can be disposed of according to his will. And then Aquinas says that, quote, the power of private persons is exercised over the things they possess. And consequently, their dealings with one another as regards such things depend on their own will, for instance, in buying, selling, giving, and so forth. Right? Uh, his illustration of, of, of this whole sphere in which uh, things are subject to private individual will over against those things that are politically regulated, his example is like, what do we do with our stuff? Buying, selling, giving stuff away. That falls under private individual will. So again, what's he saying? What he's saying, I think, is though he, and he, though he doesn't yet have the language of natural rights to say it, um, what he's saying is that quite apart from and independent of the exercise of any public authority, human beings have this naturally defined sphere of activity in which they are authorized by, by their nature as human beings, as, as creatures with free will. Um, they have a right to relate themselves to other men and to their possessions in ways that they choose. Well, the fourth and final part of this paper are, as I said, some semi-random reflections um, on how uh, we might be thinking about natural rights as Christians. Um, the first point I would make, and this is going back to Marianne Glendon's book, Rights Talk, that I mentioned earlier, um, and that is, I do think our obsession with rights today is a bit diseased to the point of being almost pathological. Uh, even though I am a libertarian, um, proudly so, I have to confess that I actually don't spend very much time thinking about rights or even natural rights. As a Christian and a churchman, I'm usually thinking about what my and my parishioners' duties are to our neighbors, and I suspect that's true for many of you. Too much attention on rights, even natural rights, may well feel unnatural to you. And I think there's a sense in which that is perhaps as it ought to be, at least in certain domains. Um, and even when I am thinking about rights as a libertarian, I'm usually not thinking about the rights that individuals have, but the absence of the right that governments have to do most of the things that they do, like printing money. So the first point is the acknowledgement that our society, I think, does have uh, perhaps a deranged relationship uh, to, to rights. My second point, however, is that this deranged relationship of our society, that our society seems to have with rights, is not the fault of the doctrine of natural rights itself. The abuse of a thing does not cancel its use. I won't quote the Latin version of that phrase back to you. And the fact that we Christians may and perhaps even ought to be more comfortable with and accustomed to the language of duties and responsibilities does not mean the concept of natural rights is unimportant. I think it is exceedingly important. And I think we deny, ignore, or downplay the validity of the concept of natural rights only at our peril and the peril of our society and of our liberties. The doctrine of natural rights is important morally. Uh, I question whether you can have moral duties without them at least implicating a corresponding category of moral rights or entitlements in our being able to perform those duties. And the doctrine of natural rights is exceedingly important politically. I think the people best equipped and the most vigilant in protecting their liberties from overreaching government are people who are well aware of what their pre-political, non-negotiable natural rights are that may not, must not be transgressed. This does not mean that they will always find it prudent to insist or act upon those natural rights, but only that they be well aware of their right to do so. The next thing I would say is that although they are objective and universal and, and rationally knowable, the derivation of natural rights is, as I said earlier, admittedly difficult. We can have, I think, a quick and easy intuition of their truth, but providing a sound, cogent, philosophical defense or account of natural rights can be quite difficult and time-consuming, such as the case with giving a philosophical account of virtually anything that is true and important and worthwhile. 
Christians need to stop being intellectually lazy or intimidated when they find rationally defending something difficult but important, and when they find that people have conflicting or confusing views on it. We're not to just throw up our hands in the air and just say, well, let's just go to the Bible. We should go to the Bible, but we go to the Bible, and the Bible is teaching us how to think. And I want to end finally with an excerpt uh, from that great natural rights document that is part of our political tradition, namely the Declaration of Independence. might seem a little hokey to read from the Declaration of Independence in a, in a talk like this. It's not the Bible that uh, Tim uh, quoted from, um, but I want to remind you that it's there. It is a natural rights document. Um, at the Macintosh home the last few years, I've been making a point of reading the Declaration. We've been making a point of reading the Declaration together um, at, uh, at the 4th of July uh, every year, and I would encourage you uh, to do the same this year. Uh, but here it is. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its, its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this presentation from the George Buchanan Forum Conference. We have many more that you can check out at our website at tgbf.org. You can also find us on YouTube or on your favorite podcasting platform. In true free market fashion, we're entirely crowdfunded by the generous support of people like you. If you'd like to help our work, you can set up one time or recurring donations at tgbf.org. The best way for others to hear about us is from their friends. So please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing our material. We greatly appreciate it.